Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Cafe Muse. I'm Maj Gama, and I'm hosting tonight alongside Ellen Cole. Henry Crawford is behind the scenes working his technical magic. Our featured poets tonight are Jessica Cuello and Mark Doty, a dream pairing on my end, as they are both truly unique voices. I will introduce Jessica and Ellen will introduce Mark. If time allows, our founder, the poet Karen Allen Ear, will host a brief Q&A. Our program is scheduled for one hour. Our audience members have been muted. This helps prevent feedback problems for our readers and ensures uninterrupted programming. Please bear with us if we do encounter a glitch. They do sometimes happen, but I know you'll forgive us if they do. During the reading, you can use the chat to comment or show your appreciation of our featured poets. On-screen on finger snaps are acceptable too. We encourage you to buy our featured author's books tonight and to donate to Cafe Muse to support our literary programs. The links for buying books and donating will be dropped in our online chat. And I hope you'll join us next month for Cafe Muse Online on March 4th, 2024 at 7.15 p.m. Eastern when our featured poets will be Yvette Nisar and Natalie Shapiro. Writing persona is a form of connection for me, says Jessica Cuello in an interview with The Rumpus. And we readers of poetry are very lucky indeed that Jessica has turned her eye to the life and times of the writer and trailblazer, Mary Shelley. Yours creature arrives as if divined through a seance or as if unearthed moldering from a poet's forgotten grave. The use of the epistolary form and the persona poem creates a truthful immediacy that grounds the reader in the truly strange history of Mary Shelley. Exhaustive research propels the poems, weaving Mary's own text and Jessica's lyric into a book that defies labels or genre. My friends gathered almost immediately in a one-off book club to discuss yours creature in depth, finding memoir, ecology, the confessional, the Gothic, all contained in vibrant compressed lines. The line breaks actual cliffhangers. Anything could change in the next line. What was this creation, this book? And it is created, almost a creature, unflinching from the messiness of birth, life, and death. It's a tribute to the early feminist texts of Mary Wollstonecraft and Mary Shelley, but the telling is all Jessica Cuello's. Creature, how female I made you. Their lineage radiates to Jessica and outward to us. Jessica Cuello's most recent book is yours, Creature, Jack Legg Press 2023. Her book, Liar, selected by Dorian Lowe for the 2020 Barrow Street Book Prize, was honored with the Eugene Nasser Prize, the CNY Book Award, and a finalist nod for the Housatonic Book Award. Cuello is also the author of Hunt from Wordworks and Pricking from Tiger Bark Press. Cuello has been awarded the 2022 Nina Riggs Poetry Prize, two CNY Book Awards, the 2016 Washington Prize, the New Letters Prize, and the New, oh New Ohio Review Poetry Prize. She is poetry editor at Tahoma Literary Review and teaches French in CNY. Please welcome Jessica to Cafe Muse. Thank you so much for that <clears throat> introduction, Majda. I feel like I will be warm all winter. <laughs> from your words, that was really beautiful. I'm so moved by that. Um, and thank you, Cafe Muse. Thank you for welcoming me so warmly. And uh, Mark Doty, it's an honor to read with you. I heard you read 20 years ago um, at Round Top, Texas in this strange little place in the woods. And you, you were the first reader and you came in late during a wild storm and you walked up to the altar because it was in a church and uh, you were a legend and you remain a legend. So I'm really honored. And I am going to read from Yours Creature, a book 
as Maj just said, it's a book of uh, pistolary poems in the voice of Mary Shelley, often addressed to her mother, the poet, uh, the writer and activist, uh, Wollstonecraft. Dear Mother, I wanted to crawl back into the black interior of you, womb scratched by an animal, but they wouldn't let me. I hung apart like gallows men, dangling for sweet touch. A line from the red radius of your womb went dark. That night, the hall of London raised its eyes to watch the comet pass, except for us. Instead, my courage cry and snarl, my cuss, my cut and run, my cutting tooth, made death a custom house. Your daughter, Mary Shelley. Mary Shelley's birth killed her mother a week and a half after she was born um, from an infection. This poem has a couple initials, and the initial G refers to Godwin, her father. He was a writer and scholar. He's the reason Percy Shelley showed up at the house. Dear Mother, I watch G's fingers on the page, neck with a faint line, neck you loved, so I love it too. He is the glaze through which I see the sun, we call the goat's beard in our field, sweet meadow, go to bed at noon, and wise father men. I touch the feathered heads to feel the god of it. At Chalk Farm, we drink the cream of syllabubs. Sister holds my arm, but I am the apple of his eye. I am the reader of his work. His frown can collapse my spine. His grief for you becomes a pillar my attention winds onto. Are you mad that I took your... G is mad with his glacial love and becomes more so despite my maniacal reading toward love. A child can kill its mother, baby wet and monstrous, slipping with eyes opened, black and white, the stewed creation, not asking to be born, but requiring. M. This one opens with a quote from Coleridge, who was a visitor in the, her childhood home. The cadaverous silence of Godwin's children is quite catacombish. Silence was my pride, my object stillness, the quiet prize. My brain was a carnation on a stem made my God of a father look at me. Quiet petals and silver pages. I meant to read until I was his perfect daughter, but P put one hand beneath my smock and all the untouched years responded. Godwin had nothing to hold me with. I didn't know He'd snap me like a stem and toss me on a pile of exile. He was my God, first partner, the sun to my green tissue. He sent me letters with formal closings, as though I was still placate in my room, leaf ribs pointed toward him, plumule hidden from all but him. Mother, you didn't raise me, Mary Shelley. This poem has the initial P, which refers to Percy. Dear mother, scratch beneath the surface of a man and there's no help. P disappears when babies die. There are so many tasks. Father hated me for being sad. I pursued ideas like a horse, a dog, always behind, raised by a dictum, but not a man. I was a tent stitch on the pocket of his mind, a grafted cut in his bark of book. I cried in the open, less girl than gnome, when the bell at the cow's neck rang tan, 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 and I took my first affection from her wet black eye. 
yours as ever and unmothered, Mary. This poem has a line from one of Mary Shelley's letters. Dear mother, I had a dream that my little baby came to life again. What is it to make a life that dies? Like God, it cannot stand to stay. Cabbage leaves are soft like cloth and smell of tea. I wore them on my breasts like medicine. The earthy taste of tea made me hate my flesh. I didn't know if I was made of anything else. Her 13 days were the only time and they had no measure. Clouds swirled like bands of twisted cloth. I'm sorry to burden you. As a child, I was spooked by the empty hall when father moved us in. At first, he loved me like I was you. And in the dream, we rubbed it by the fire and it lived. Yours as ever, Mary. I'm sure many of you in the audience know the detail that of her four children, only one survived into adulthood. This poem has a reference to the famous summer uh, that she spent with Shelley and Byron writing Frankenstein. And it was also the summer that uh, there was a volcanic eruption that filled the sky with ash and it was called the year without a summer. Dear mother, I was aware of you the year without a summer the sunlight reddened. My hands too were weather backward. People looted the warehouses of grain. It rained red, but we remained courted, issued from the other. It rained 100 days. The river came to new marks. The world matched our minds. And I invented a doctor who cobbled together a man. I who copy you, Mary. Dear creature, and partway through the book, the poems begin to address her creature and a couple of years. The sea of ice was my favorite distraction. We kept a squirrel inside a box who bit me. P carried him a while, the way he carried kindness, useless and external like a man. At night when we read Christabel, P thought my nipples were eyes. He ran away afraid. I suppose each hole of my body is an eye, especially my mouth, repulsed by the heat of its need. Your monstrous creator, M.S. Dear creature, P and I read each other's writings and I am relieved a little of desire. The child said, some beings don't live long, pointing to the dragonfly. In my womb, the child moved beneath the skin and lifted the surface in the shape of an arm. I thought how the other children's arms were tucked in and never seen, an arm against a sack of blue. Once the hardness of my mind dropped to the womb, creature, you opened each brain window, a god that jumped from ear to ear. Sometimes I listened for you when I touched P. You came with his voice. His hand could draw you. Your creator, M.S. And then one last poem. <clears throat> Dear Mother, we rent a house in Italy Black currants stain our fingertip prints, sorry, stain our fingerprints. We write in red, mother and child. My skin remembers P's glyptic touch, the sex we had beside your grave. When I was 15, his words were earnest like a slingshot. We gospelized you. I prepare fermented fish, the tiny blade lifts the bones like threads. P is a genius of wander and invention. Not one domestic task takes his attention. And I in the kitchen, 
am a genius of famine. Your loving daughter, Mary Shelley. Thank you so much. This is such a thrill to be here. Um, all these beautiful people in the audience, Cafe Muse and Mark Doty, thank you so much. So oh, thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Ellen Cole, and I'm thrilled to introduce one of my poet heroes, one of the most accomplished living poets in America, Mark Doty. Mark is the author of 10 poetry collections and six books of prose. His work has received many awards and honors, including the National Book Award, the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Penn Award for First Nonfiction, a Whiting Award, and in the UK, the T.S. Eliot Award. He was the first American to receive the T.S. Eliot Award. Mark's books, My Alexandria and Atlantis, written in the 90s, changed the national conversation on the AIDS epidemic. I particularly admire Mark's bravery in writing so frankly and intimately about his life as a gay man in America, especially his terrible grief over his partner's death from AIDS at a time when homophobia was rampant and to be homosexual was widely regarded as sinful and AIDS itself was considered a just punishment for that sin. Mark also has had a distinguished career as a professor of poetry. He's taught at the University of Iowa, Princeton, Sarah Lawrence, Columbia, and NYU. He was a professor in the University of Houston's creative writing program and recently retired from teaching at Rutgers University, where he was the distinguished professor and writer in residence in the English department. He's a trustee of the Griffin Trust for Excellence in Poetry and the chancellor of the American Academy of Poets. Mark's work is piercing, lush, ecstatic, elegiac. He writes about the hunger of being alive. In his book, Deep Lane, a stork is a white appetite. A mole is a star-nosed engine of desire. His poem, Hungry Ghosts, is spoken by a spirit who is ravenous but has no mouth. Mark knows what it's like to slip into a trance. In his memoir, what is grass, Walt Whitman in my life? He describes falling into an altered state as a young man lying in a pine grove. I became aware of a young tree. In myself, I felt its presence. I acknowledged its presence. Then the tree acknowledged me back. And this sense of the living energy of the tree expands to include the whole forest and even the wind surging above his head. Mark invokes this energy that exists outside of himself many times in his most recent book, Deep Lane, as well as in other writings. Voices that sound like his parents come to him in a garden Walt Whitman appears so vividly, the speaker can smell the talcum powder on his skin. His mother speaks to him through a snake in the garden. A vision in a neighborhood barbershop shows him, the men I have outlived await their turns, the fevered and wasted, whose mothers and lovers scattered their ashes and gave away their clothes. 20 years, and their names tumble into a numb well. Though in truth, I have not forgotten one of you. May I never forget one of you. These layers of men arrayed in their no longer breathing 
ranks. I think I better stop here before I quote the whole book to you. Let me turn the mic over to the remarkable and in Jessica's words, legendary poet, Mark Doty. Very moving, Ellen. Thank you so much. Um, I feel read, which is is the best thing for any writer to show somebody has really, truly paid attention and taken an idea. So it's a great pleasure to know you and a great pleasure to receive that introduction. And Jessica, that was a wonderful reading. Um, the richness of those poems and that dense Gothic atmosphere uh, is so convincing, so alive. Uh, and Shelley, a genius of wonder. I feel like I've done a fair bit of that myself. I am uh, uh, in an interesting position of having moved uh, just a, not quite a year ago. After 21 years in an apartment in New York City, um, I moved to upstate New York. And one of the things that happened here is that I discovered I could write about the city again, which I was I had become unable to do while I was there. I needed some distance and to stand back. I have been writing about the farm, but none of that is finished. It's too new, too inchoate. So I want to read you a couple of poems that have to do with the city of New York and the great intensification of life that that city brings, and um, then a couple of other things. So here we go. One of the characteristics of urban life is that you get to know people you don't know at all. You know, there are people that you just see all the time, and, and maybe they're approachable and maybe they aren't. And this is one of those. The poem is called Imperative. He's my age, the man leaning dark against the storefront window ledge, hair and beard dusted white, face impressed with a frazzled net of lines. He doesn't attempt to please or seem in need, but practices all day a toneless, steady neutrality, repeating his monosyllabic plea, change. He's a prisoner who's learned to show almost no deference to his guards, nothing of abasement, He's a barely rippling tank of dark water, superbly contained. He submits to a precise degree he's had years to gauge. Change, he says all day, fixing his spot on seventh, not a word, the word not a question, but a key he tries again, hoping this time the tumblers turn. His voice at night more driven, change, as if he meant to chip away at something, the word falling hard on the sidewalk's flint and shadow, ringing on the pavement like a dime. So um, I, I lived all my time in New York in a, a co-op apartment, uh, that kind of weird Manhattan sort of real estate, city real estate, where you know we all owned shares in the building, but you, you didn't really own your apartment. It was an odd situation. And we had, of course, a, a board. It was a little building, so we were all members of the board, and we had to have meetings, and we had to um, deal with the pronouncements and character of our lifetime board president. So you'll meet her here. It, this is called Ghost Story, West 16th Street. Pam lived 40 years in apartment one and ran our co-op with an iron hand. She ruled by simply keeping needed information to herself. Two doors opened from her place into the hall. If I came down late, the year the buzzer didn't work, to greet some man I'd soon come to know, or fumbled with my keys at 4 a.m., I felt her eye fixed behind a peephole that bent the hallway light around me to a ring of not shame exactly, but a stubborn residual embarrassment. Two months dead, she seems to hover at the door still, vigilant, disapproving, not on moral grounds, but because you never know. Secretary for our meetings, I duly noted when she announced, if you're having a visitor at night, well, lucky for you, but be sure to escort him to the door. Abrasive, she hated conflict. If anyone stood up to her, she'd cry. She earned her, man, her MSW at Hunter years before, an afternoon saw clients in her dim, cat-shadowed parlor beside an untouched upright so heavy the floor beneath it sank. Sometimes I'd see her ushering patients out, beaming at each a benevolence so at odds with how I knew her, it made me dizzy. After surgery, leaning one night against the stairs she hadn't climbed in years, she reached to touch me through the balustrade and said, I am utterly tired of life. Her daughter, a professor in a distant state, had four decades of her mother's things hauled away, feckless piano among them, and accepted an offer, a million and a half in cash. A floor through, after all, with an airless private garden in the back. 
the renovation is nearly done. I took a tour and here's what startled me. That rueful, hectoring, sarcastic spirit presided still. For that money, she thought, it ought to be beautiful, modern, nothing for ghosts to catch on. It's hard enough to leave. Don't you know I love you all? It's really, it's really hard not to read that poem. I want to do Pam's voice when I read it, you know. Well, you never know, you never know. <laughs> Without overdoing it. So um, in this, this poem is about the, the now this is, I do not exaggerate, the tragedy of losing one's keys in New York City. You know? When you lose your keys in, in other places, there is sort of a reasonable possibility, you know, you'll find them again. This could happen. Not here. This is called No Orpheus. Dropped in the gulf of a midnight taxi's backseat dark, slipped through that coat pocket hole you'd always meant to mend, tumbled down a curbside drain into an underworld so labyrinthine no Orpheus could find his way. Lose your keys here and face the sheer awful wall of irretrievable, all that won't be found again. 400 years in New York City, how many keys go on head over teeth into the deep water canyons of the invisible? Whole bronze reefs of them, tips and ridges gleaming in the murk, Atlantean, those useless brassy shoals, the rooms they opened immaterial now. Doors and lockboxes, drawers and diaries that open to no one's touch. The poet stumbles back from Shadowland, empty-handed. His keys, more of them every blessed night and day, once and always gone. No poetry in that, he thinks, or else there's nothing else. A few years back, some friends of mine, uh, Marie Howe and Donna Massini, wonderful poets, um, put together a, a, an event. Uh, we were going to gather in Washington Square, winter, and read poems in response to police, uh, racially motivated violence on the part of the police, which was horrified as, as everyone was in those days by what we were seeing, what suddenly became visible. And um, I was, you know, I knew when the reading was, the date was set, I, you know, nights before I was up late working, 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 trying to get this thing right. And, uh, and finally I, I had it more or less together. I went to the event, there, there was no audience. There were 50 poets. We were all standing in a ring around a fountain in Washington Square, bitter cold day. And we read these poems to each other. And about halfway through, I turned around and there was a young cop but behind me. And he said, what's going on here? And I said, well, we're reading poems about racially motivated violence on the part of the police. And he said, good. So, great. This is called In Two Seconds, and it remembers Tamir Rice, a 12 year old boy who was killed in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, when he was playing with a plastic gun in the park, which was mistaken for a real one. Um, the title of the poem flows right into the first line and it keeps recurring. In two seconds, the boy's face climbed back down the 12 year tunnel of its becoming, a charcoal sunflower swallowing itself. What has eyes to see or ears to hear? If you could see what happens fastest, unmaking the human irreplaceable, a star falling into complete gravitational darkness from all points of itself, all this, the held loved body into which entered milk and music, honeying the cells of him who sang to him, stroked the nap of the scalp, kissed the flesh knot after the cord completed its work of fueling into him the long history of those whose suffering was made more bearable by the as yet unknown of him, playing alone in some unthinkable future city, a Cleveland, whatever that might be. Two seconds, relapse. The arc of joy in the conception bed, the labor of hands repeated until the hands no longer required attention, so that as the woman folded, her hopes for him sank into the fabric of his shirts and underpants. Down they go, swirling down into the maw of a greater dark. Treasure box, comic books, pocket knife, bell from the lost cat's collar, why even begin to enumerate them when behind every tributary poured into him comes rushing backward all he hasn't been yet. Everything that boy could have thought or made, sung or theorized, built on the quavering but continuous structure that had preceded him, sank into an absence in the shape of a boy playing with a plastic gun in a city park in Ohio in the middle of the afternoon. When I say two seconds, I don't mean the time it took him to die. 
I mean the lapse between the instant the cruiser break to a halt on the grass, between that moment and the one in which the officer fired his weapon. The two seconds taken to assess the situation. And though I believe it is the work of art to try on at least the moment and skin of another, but this hour I respectfully decline. I refuse it. May that officer be visited every night of his life by an enormity collapsing in front of him into an incomprehensible gloom and the voice that howls out of it. If this is no poem, then. With that voice, a raced boy, beloved of time, who did nothing to no one and became nothing because of it, I know that voice is one of the things we call poetry. It isn't to his killer he's speaking. This is an end of the love poem. And it's, it's slightly longer, but it's hopefully entertaining. It's called Summons. Prose poem. In bits. The Summons. Suppose you made a taxonomy of kisses in their vast variety. The kiss on the cheek of a child heading out for the day. The kiss on the forehead you give a friend departing after she's unburdened herself in a long conversation. The complex vocabulary of kisses between the long coupled who signal through them a host of things. But those aren't the kisses you really want to study. Could you name the kisses of lovers? Distinguish their nuances, the shades of passion? You would like to do the research for this, but then you realize it's what you have been doing, what you are doing, what you plan to do. When he used to kiss me, I felt he was hitting my mouth, striking at me with the teeth beneath his lips. Why didn't I stop him? My mother's kiss, when it came, always seemed to bring a small disturbance of air carrying her sense a floral soap from Mexico, lipstick, coffee, a bracing whiff from the mouth of a just opened bottle of vodka. The first time I kissed, we were standing on a fire escape at night behind an old hotel and there were freight cars moving on the tracks beneath us, tracks that spread in all directions into the snow. You're just warming up to the one kiss you really wanna talk about. When that kiss comes, it doesn't matter that you've known them for a few years in an easy way, lightweight, pleasant, something breezy about it, as if he blew in now and then on a wind arrived from a climate where gravity doesn't work as hard as it does in New York. He's always seemed young, not especially attached, so perhaps that's just because he hasn't told you much. You always like him, his freshness and his enthusiasm for pleasure, which is why you keep seeing him again, though the expectation is just for a few bright hours. And then, as we say, out of the blue, out of nowhere, without anything obvious changing, Something shifts imperceptibly, but clearly, like the atmosphere after a storm, magnetic charge, ions, something in the clockworks. There's a newly open space, an aperture in which the kiss can take place. You're lying together, face to face and half undressed. You've done this many times, but the unexpected way your torsos fall into each other, unwilled, is the overture. As your faces come together, the kiss, before it's a kiss, is a fuse that begins a long burn, a nearly visible black sparkle traversing more distance than you'd imagine, coiling its way through the space between you in two directions, into his chest as well as into yours. Hello, light and heat. Hello, nextness. And then his beauty laid out like an entire field of candles in yellow grass. You saw it before, but never saw it. Not all lit like this. Hello. His beauty, an explosion inside a clear room at the bottom of the ocean, the shock wave just now reaching you. Beauty, the defining character of his body, but not resident there only, connected instead to something larger above him, free floating cloud, suddenly ours in common, spilling down into you until you're lit up also, a cove of small waves crested by phosphorus. The kiss is immense, although you understand it once, not a thought exactly, more a felt sensation that its intimacy is what allows for this tremendous scale. Does the kiss even have an edge? It goes on in every way. Why would you want it to stop, except to take stock a second, to catch your breath so you can dive into that wave again, and go under, and dive again? It takes a while to know the space in which you live, the element in which your body moves has changed. From here on out, with each immersion, you are less contained. To be that desired, what is that? to have that opening, that entrance awaiting you, to know it's there, to dissolve the edges of you, that it isn't just the mouth, just the body that is opened by the kiss. From the first moment, you know that the kiss is a fact, as real as this table and chair, but utter promise, both utter promise and total trouble. 
if this is in the world, this possibility, if you know the address of such a place where the flaming meadow and the glowing wavelets dwell in the late hours together, where his beauty is the solvent in which you both are dissolved and remade in the crazy furnace of the kiss, why would you want to be anywhere else? It's an imperative, a summons, a bell. And what are you going to do about that? Thank you. Mark, that was a, a beautiful reading. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Jessica and Mark. What a great reading. And what I heard from both of you was this proliferation of voices. And so I would like you to speak about what the voice means to you and whether you might project your poetic voice into theater and put these voices on stage. We've seen that with other poets. In fact, we have one in the audience, Grace Cavallari, who has done that remarkably over time. And so, Jessica, could you start and talk about that? I could. I'm still thinking about kissing. Um. <laughs> well, okay. That's a good subject. I'm trying to enter the spirit of the Q&A, but I'm still in the dreaminess of the kiss. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so the question is about voices and entering a voice and adapting it to the stage. Is that? Yes. 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 Um, it's funny. I did do high school theater, but every year that I get older, I become more and more introverted and shy and it's like the I'm like moving in the opposite direction of <laughs> speaking and I feel like poetry for me so far has been very much this doesn't make sense to all the poets listening but so much of my poetry exists inside and I hear it inside and I I'm one of the few poets I know that I don't even say my poems aloud when I'm writing them which I know is, I know everyone's going to be like, oh my God, you're, how can you do that? Um, so the stage seems so remote to me as a, even though I love, I love to go to the theater and sit in the dark and listen to it and watch it. Um, but yeah, what, let's see what Mark says. Okay, let's see what Mark says. But I, I hear you could do shadow puppets Jessica. I actually have in my classroom at least 12 puppets. And in one of my classrooms, I had a theater built in the corner by some students. And often when I'm teaching, I use puppets. And the older the students, the more they love it. Yes, they were exactly. all kidnapped last year. Sorry, I'm way off poetry track. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Well, I love theatricality. And I think you know, I, I grew up in an era when poets all read in this voice that was supposed to make the poem feel special and flatten that out, you know, no drama, right? And it always had that rising inflection that was to tell you there was a line break. You know, I go to the store, I buy some bread and some milk, and I'll parcel the poem out. I hate that. Uh, I, I thought it turned the poem into something sort of automated, uh, artificial. So I wanted to sound like a person talking, but I actually want the acting out or the drama to take place in the reader's head, not, not in, in front of you, exactly. Um, I will animate it with my voice, but I don't want to uh, play the part. Why? Um, I think it could get in the way of you experiencing the poem. I think the only times that I have seen poets do this, um, I have wished for a director, you know, who would step in and, and maybe tone things down or, or you know, refine a gesture. Um, I just think it's a risky territory because, you know, it's hard enough to translate your interiority into poem on the page, much less make something that would resemble what you, the shiny things you see and hear, you know, in your head while you're composing. I just, I can't imagine myself doing it. Well, that's not, those answers weren't answers I expected, but um, that's always the beauty of this question and answer period. You know, you don't expect my question. I don't expect your answer. And, um, but I think that, it's one of those dialectical things that come about, you know, that inevitably, you know, poetry started in this world as an oral tradition. And, you know, when you think about the Iliad and the Odyssey and how they, the troubadours came around to the town and 
projected, you know, their voices. And so it, it, it was a type of theater, you know, although, you know, theater comes in various ways, you know, sometimes theater comes with, you know, the, the singing voice, you know, but um, yes, I, I think, you know, you both read your poems beautifully and we get, you know, the theater uh, in you uh, that way. But anyway, I do thank you very much. And I'm going to turn this program back to Ellen. Unless there's something else that somebody wants to ask that I have missed somewhere. A um, quick question. Is that okay for yes, Jessica? Sure. Um, one thing I, I, I saw that Annie Finch blurbed your book and she is the poetry witch and the queen of meter. So um as I said in my introduction, I, I really felt like every line of this, of every poem in this book was just a hairpin turn. So I wanted to know if you, if you used meter, if the poetry which advised you to use meter or if you used meter. And I would love to hear uh, if Mark, you know, has been using meter recently and what he thinks about that. So it's interesting because when I, when I wrote these, poems I was not um I didn't have much of a community so sometimes like my first four books I would just find a well-known poet that I could someone didn't know me and I would pay them to read and she had was offering that at the time and I admired her work so I sent it to her but when I sent it to her I said I I don't know if you're going to like this because this is free verse and it's I'm following this uh, epistolary format and it, there's, it's not prose, but it's certainly not metered. And, um, but there, there is a, I think I spent so much time when I was young writing metered poetry very badly. Um, and I also feel like back to the idea of theater and sound. I do hear, even though I don't say my poems aloud, I do hear the music of my poems. Um, and I've, as I've done readings this year, I surprise myself by what I hear by saying them aloud in front of people because the the music shifts from my internal voice to my external voice. Um, but these I didn't write with a particular, although I, I had a sound, but it wasn't a metered, I wasn't following a, a form, but that's there. And Annie Finch liked them, even though they weren't metered. She was like, no. <laughs> so. Thank you, Mark. I think um, some of the first poems that I, I knew, they weren't exactly poems, but the uh, uh, hymns we used to sing on the porch swing summer nights. I you know, grew up in Tennessee um, early on. Uh, we were Presbyterians, and so we knew all those old songs, and my parents and my grandparents would sing them. Um, and there was something about, you know, Swing Low Sweet Chariot or the Old Rugged Cross or on and on, uh, those songs that offered a, the sacred. It was a, a language for elevated feeling, for vision, and it was metrical and it was set to music. And that seems to me like a, a, a kind of training in listening to sound. I don't write metrical poems, but when I am approaching moments of real meaning or, or, or moments of real emotion, it tends to come out with some, you know, some iambic cadence or other kinds of meter that are, are built in as it were. And for me, that, that's the only kind of meter in which I could work because it, it, it doesn't fit my experience. Uh, whereas I know there are people who, the people, same people who love crossword puzzles and like certain kinds of mathematical problems also really enjoy writing in meter. There's, there's a kind of mindset that one is stimulated by meter as opposed to locked in by it. And this also extends to something like writing sonnets or villanelles that if you if you love solving that kind of problem, this can be a wonderful door opening thing for you. And if you don't, um, it might just be jail. If I write a sonnet, I will probably use it as a composing device and knock it out of the form before it's a poem that I would show anybody. For other people, it's a, a key. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Well, uh, um, there's there's a, there is another question in the uh, chat, and it's it. This is uh, what can we look forward to seeing from uh, both uh, of you 
um, Jessica and Mark. So Jessica, do you have something else in the works? You don't have to say if you don't want to. I mean, that's, you know, something that is optional, but, you know. I do. Um, I have a draft of a new book that I'm, it's not persona. It's very uh, vulnerable and it kind of traces three generations of women. It has some very personal poems and it has pieces of letters from my grandmother. And it feels so raw that um, I'm kind of hanging on to it. I also just need a break from like doing the, here's my book, like <laughs> it's PR. I just need a, a year of like, I think just reading again, because I, I feel like I've gotten caught up a little bit in like trying to promote, which is important. But um, and I'm I think I'm a little scared of the new book, but I think it's good. I'm just letting it sit. It's a new kind of you creature, huh? Yeah, it's a creature. <laughs> it's definitely a, a monstrous creature. Um, but it's a little bit closer, I think. So, and it has prose sections, which I've never done before, and I kept trying to take these pro sections and put them into pantoums and sestinas and they would not, they wanted to be narrative little prose pieces. And I finally accepted that. And so, you know, the form is a little bit unusual for me too. So I'm just seeing where I I'm letting it sit a little bit. I also don't want to make anyone mad who's in it. <laughs> <laughs> so, sounds good. How about you, Mark? What do, what do you have to say, if anything? And don't feel obligated. No, um, I, I feel so connected to what you just said, Jessica, because I've spent a lot of time being, you know, an externally uh, visible poet, talking about poetry, meeting people, reading. And there's a point where you're going to have to withdraw from that. You know, how do you can't get from that, if you do it a lot, readily to the interior life. And so I have slowed way down, and I am um, now... I've probably two thirds of the way done with a book of poems that's really centered on my life in the city and moves towards um, the crisis times of the lockdown, the pandemic, uh, what New York was like during the riots that followed uh, the, the Black Lives Movement, the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement, which was uh, incredibly difficult. And, and I went from a, a kind of wet manic embrace of the city to feeling that the suffering around me was so intensely visible that I had to respond to it. So, um, yeah, so that. And, and those poems have been hard for me to shape, but I'm feeling now I'm suddenly able to do that again. I'm far enough away that I'm kind of getting a handle on that material. Hopefully, you know, hmm. before too long. That's as definite as I can be about it, but that will be a book of poems. And then beyond that, poems about this life, uh, which will are stylistically so far, what I've scribbled is utterly different and stylistically really interesting to me. Strange, eventful. Well, thank you both. I think this is as far as we're going to go. Henry, did you have anything else that you were trying to get my attention for? No, good. Okay. Well, I think I'll now turn it back to Ellen. Thank you very much, both Majda and Ellen, for hosting tonight. Ellen, take it away. And thank you, Karen, for your interesting questions. And uh, Chris, I think, you, who submitted the question about what are you working on next? Thank you also. And while I'm thanking people, Mark and Jessica, again, you know, this has been a wonderful reading. Thank you so much. And I want to thank my fellow co-hosts, Maj Tagama, Renee Garrity, Henry Crawford, Claire McGough, and Luther J for the hard work that goes behind these programs. Most importantly, I want to thank our wonderful audience for being here. If you want to watch tonight's program again, it will be up on Cafe Muse's YouTube channel tomorrow, and you can extend your enjoyment by purchasing the poet's books. The link is in the chat and telling others about the series. I hope you'll join us for the next Cafe Muse program on Monday, March 4 at 7.15, featuring two wonderful poets, Yvette Nasser and Natalie Shapiro. 
Please make sure you're registered on Cafe Muse website so you'll receive the information on the event as well as the Zoom link. Have a wonderful evening, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you next month.